Today on Seculo, you might not even believe this, but President Biden and the White House have launched an Islamophobia task force as anti-Semitism plagues the U.S. and radical Muslims are killing Jews in Israel. Keeping you informed and engaged, now more than ever, this is Seculo. We want to hear from you. Share and post your comments or call 1-800-684-3110. And now your host, Jordan Seculo. All right, welcome to Seculo. We've got a lot to talk about today. Uh, there was some interesting information released of all timing. I mean, the timing always off at this White House. When you hear uh, Vice President Harris is going to make an address with a teleprompter, it's kind of shocking. And you see these tweets and you're like, are they living in the same universe we are? Are they living in a parallel world i mean you you even try to figure out an explanation for it like maybe there's a reason they did this uh at this time and then you're like no i can't think of any reason so i want to start the show off with exactly what i said in the tease if you missed the tease president biden and the white house announced yesterday the launching of an islamophobia task force as anti-semitism against jews based off their own fbi director christopher ray is what is plaguing the U.S. so dangerously right now. 2.4 million Jews in America, 60% of the religious hate crimes are against Jews, not Muslims. But take a listen to, to Kamala Harris announcing this new task force. And so today, I am proud to announce the Biden-Harris administration will develop our nation's first national strategy to counter Islamophobia. This strategy will be a comprehensive and detailed plan to protect Muslims and those perceived to be Muslim from hate, bigotry, and violence, and to address the concern that some government policies may discriminate against Muslims. For example, the so-called Muslim ban, which President Biden revoked on our first day in office. All right, folks, they call it the Muslim ban, but it didn't ban all Muslims, of course, from coming to America or getting visas. It was countries that were, were not able to vet people when they were putting them on planes to America or basically failed states that had no ability to know who was going on a plane. The original travel ban list only lasted for 90 days. It was Iran, surprising. I mean, I think that's still in place. I don't think you just fly over here from Iran unless you're an official going to a U.N. meeting. Iraq, where we engaged still in a war. Libya, which was a to- totally failed state controlled by ISIS. Somalia, I remember what happened, of course, in Benghazi. Somalia, a terrorist-run state. Sudan, uh, up until now the overthrow of Bashir, and now still in uh, a, a state of kind of who controls what. The military has taken over. But at that time, it was Omar Bashir, an international war criminal, wanted by the International Criminal Court. Syria, who was using chemical weapons against its own people. And Yemen, who was shooting rockets into our ally, Saudi Arabia. There's a lot more Muslims around the world in Asia and the Middle East that weren't on that ban list, including some of the largest Muslim countries in the world, like Indonesia and Pakistan and India. Those Muslims weren't barred. This wasn't a Muslim ban. It was a terror ban. Well, let me tell you what the worst part of this is. Rising anti-Semitism to heights we haven't seen since uh, Germany 1930 are happening in the United States of America. And on that very day when they arrest the Cornell student who was threatening the Jewish students, on that very day, the White House decides to come out with a task force on Islamophobia. Now, think about this. Jews are being, and Israelis are being slaughtered in their own country. Anti-Semitism, Christopher Ray said the highest it's ever been. And Islamophobia is what's on the mind of the Biden White House. This is the reason why we need you to stand with the American Center for Law and Justice. Uh, We are in our faith and freedom drive, and we're in a moment in history that none of us would have ever thought we'd see, but here we are. We're witnessing uh, horrible atrocities internationally and even on our own country, especially on college campuses. We're sending uh, demand letters to the East European Union, congressional leaders, the U.N. Security Council. We are representing students that are being harassed because they're Jewish or Christian students who are pro-Zionist. All of this does. All of this happens because of your support for the ACLJ. Support our work and our faith and freedom drive. Any amount you donate, we get a match. And if you can make that a recurring gift, you become an ACLJ champion. Biden-
administration announcing the first ever national strategy to counter Islamophobia. The joint effort, led by the Domestic Policy Council and National Security Council, aims to protect Muslims and those perceived to be Muslim from discrimination, hate, bigotry, and violence. Officials will work with community leaders, advocates, and members of Congress to develop a comprehensive plan. They are facing some pushback from elements of the Muslim American community over the administration's staunch support for Israel and its war against Hamas in Gaza. This happened yesterday. The Biden administration unveiling this all as anti-Semitism itself skyrockets. Today, I am proud to announce the Biden-Harris administration will develop our nation's first national strategy to counter Islamophobia. This strategy will be a comprehensive and detailed plan to protect Muslims and those perceived to be Muslim from hate, bigotry, and violence and to address the concern that some government policies may discriminate against Muslims. Talk about tone deaf. Uh, here's a woman who doesn't even listen to her own FBI director or a, po or a White House that doesn't look at what's happening in this country and doesn't understand the number one issue is anti-Semitism. Ari Fleischer calling this move by the Biden White House a political move to hold on to Muslim votes in swing state Michigan. All his Arab American support for the president literally in a poll this week dips from 59 percent to 17 percent. The Muslim American community has traditionally been uh, a significant component of the Democratic Democratic base, particularly in swing states like Michigan, there are some growing concerns within the Democratic Party, not necessarily that they're going to turn around and vote for Republicans, but that Muslim Americans could stay home or throw their way behind a protest vote. That could drain some support from President Biden as he seeks to, to win re-election uh, and in races where uh, that are decided by tens of thousands of votes. Something like this could potentially uh, make a difference. We are always honored to be joined by our very good friend of the ACLJ and of the Seculos, uh, Senator Bill Haggerty of Tennessee, who had an opportunity to question Secretary Blinken and uh, Samantha Power about this money that is an aid that is still planned on going to Hamas, even after the atrocities of October 7th in Israel and the ongoing atrocities and the kidnapped hostages that have not been released, including Americans. And by the way, that number keeps going up, it seems. We find out there are more hostages. We've So many people have seen the horrendous images uh, of what happened and how these uh, Hamas terrorists really took over like ISIS, or even worse, uh, committing crimes against children, women, men, and the elderly. And Senator Haggerty took it right to, Senator, uh, to Secretary Blinken. And Senator Haggerty, let me ask you this, and thank you for joining us such a busy time in the U.S. and the world. Senator Haggerty, when you went to to Blinken, what did he say? It's not like American accountants are on the ground tracking what Hamas is going to do with this aid or uh, who's going to get it and whether actual people in need will ever get it. Well, they, you know, they, they um, want to come to us and ask for billions of dollars in, quote, U.S. foreign assistance to go into the Gaza Strip. The Gaza Strip is controlled by Hamas. I confronted Secretary Blinken with emails that we discovered, internal emails from the State Department. We received these via Freedom of Information Act request. I entered those into the record, and I recited to him um, you know, exactly what they said. There is a high risk that those funds will, will be able to go to the benefit of Hamas. Hamas is the terrorist organization that just launched a murderous attack on the Israelis and killed over 1,400 people. And included in that number were you know, some 36 Americans that they murdered. So when I asked Secretary Blinken if he could assure me that the aid dollars that the United States has already sent into Gaza weren't involved in supporting Hamas's attack on October the 7th, he couldn't assure me of that. He doesn't know, clearly. I asked him point blank three times, and three times. Uh, I kept coming back to the question as he kept trying to evade it. He could not answer me that American dollars aren't basically funding both sides of this war. That's the last place we want to see American taxpayer dollars spent. I don't want to see a dime of American taxpayer dollars going to a mosque so that they can use that again in turn to kill more Israeli citizens and, and, and include Americans in that as well. You know, Senator, I, one of the things I'm concerned about is that they, they appear to be, the administration appears to be totally tone deaf. They announced yesterday that they're starting a task force on Islamophobia. That was the same day that Christopher Ray testified before uh, Congress saying that the 60% of the hate crimes that are religiously motivated are against Jews. 
60%, and they only represent 2.6% of the population. And the response from the White House on that is, let's have a task force on Islamophobia. I, 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 it appears they're totally tone deaf. Yeah, I think, um, you know, it, it, it's been called out in the media. I did an interview yesterday with Larry Kudlow. He accurately coined it. He basically said what they're doing, they meaning the Biden White House, are pandering to the far left extreme radicals in their own party. These are the ones that are doing the pro-Palestinian, you know, rallies in the cities and on our college campuses. Um, these are the people that are, you know, basically aligning, them, aligning themselves, you know, with, with Nazism. And they are so desperate to maintain this, quote, quote, broad coalition of fringe groups and activist groups that have, you know, certainly radical views based on, you know, the, the, where most of America is. But they're willing to do anything to pander to them, to keep them in the boat, so to speak. So that in you know critical congressional districts uh, like in Michigan, they're able to continue to use these people, and that they're going to the White House. These groups are going to the White House. Pressure groups are going to the White House, saying, "Look, we helped you, Joe Biden. We went door to door campaigning for you, Joe Biden, back in 2020 to help you win that election, and you're going to lose us if you don't start catering to us." And that's where you see you know Kamala Harris come out with this pandering and creating these working groups and all this sort of thing. They will not even say who's at the root of all of this. That's Iran. You know, it's very difficult to get the White House to even acknowledge Iran's role in all of this. And if you saw what happened, you know, w w with Hamas, that was Iranian funding, that's Iranian technology, that's Iranian know-how that was deployed to murder over 1,400 Jews. And we weren't planning on it. We were together, uh, Senator Haggerty, when this attack occurred. And it was shocking, the brutality we kept seeing on our phones, uh, the reactions that were being made, and uh, just the, again, that we had never seen Hamas take it to the level of ISIS or maybe even surpassing isis and then yeah. you know we see christopher ray testify very openly and honestly about the issues jews are facing right here in the united states mm -hmm. that this group of just 2.4 million uh people face 60 percent of the religious hate crimes and the next day the vice president is announcing this council on islamophobia i think that one americans even after 9 11 showed we don't have a major problem with islamophobia there are radical extremists on Americans who have bad views on people, but most Americans are good people and respect you if you respect them. Why, again, is it purely politics that they announce this because they don't want to lose the votes from the squad? Jordan, I think you, you, you hit the nail on the head. That's, that's all I can imagine it is. It's politics that's responding to pressure groups and the extreme radical left that are pushing this. You know, this is un-American what they're talking about. We have Jewish citizens that are fearful of their lives here in America. Even one of my own colleagues, you know, it, it suffered a severe threat, uh, Jackie Rosen. And um, we, we have got to bring this under control instead of pandering. We need to be standing strong with Israel and with our Jewish neighbors right here in America. Uh, it's totally unacceptable when you have these threatening protests taking place in our cities and on our college campuses that are making, you know, young Jewish people, old, elderly Jewish people, anybody of that faith uh, deeply concerned. And when Christopher Ray comes out, as you, you aptly mentioned, and highlights the fact that the vast majority of these hate crimes in America on taking place in American soil, and I, I don't condone any hate crime. You know that we're against that right. at, at every level. But the the disproportionate impact of that on our Jewish citizens and the fact that it's gone up over 400 percent since October the seventh is alarming. And we need to be do something about doing something about that. Sen Senator, there is a movement in the House of what passing the House of Representatives, a bill that's going to be a standalone, at least that's the plan, standalone for aid to Israel. Uh, the Senate side, your, your, your side of that, uh, Congress, some have said we'd rather have that combined with Ukraine. What, what's your view on that? My view is get the aid to Israel as quick as you can, and I'll, I'm not opposed to aid to Ukraine either. But, I mean, it's just I, I, I understand why you'd want it standalone. But what, what's your sense of that? No, I, I, I think uh, the House has read it right. There's there's broad support in America, forgetting the, you know, the, the, the radical stuff coming out of the White House, broad support in America to get this aid to Israel right now. We're watching this unfold on television. We want to see it come to an end. We want to see it come to an end quickly and get the Israelis the support they need to do the job that they know how to do. Senator, That's we are working here. closely with uh, hostage families. And, um, in fact, uh, next week we're going to be in Washington with those families, and, and we're, um, we're working with your staff um, for you to be able to meet with uh, some of them. These are representatives of the families that are uh, hostages, mothers, fathers, brothers. I mean, it's it, they're making it. This is the first time it will be Israelis coming. Um, this is situation with the hostages has complicated 
a lot of what's going on in the Middle East right now because Israel, there's a lot of pressure on Israel not to uh, go into full tilt war here and rather, you know, give this kind of ceasefire to, to get this worked out and see if you can get the hostages out. That never tends to work. What's your sense of that uh, on, on that front? I'm completely sympathetic to the concern. I think this is also by design. This is why Hamas took the hostages. Exactly. Uh, you know, I think Iran has, you know, demonstrated their control over Hamas and Hezbollah. Uh, Iran was the one that, you know, Iran trained Hamas. They've, they've armed them. They funded them. So I think this is part of the Iranian uh, playbook. And the, the Biden administration has demonstrated they're willing to put a massive price on the heads of hostages. The $6 billion package that came through put a $1.2 billion price tag on it heads of every American. So we've incentivized the taking of hostages. We've uh, therefore complicated immensely what the Israeli um, IDF has to do is they move in to try to free the hostages at the same time, put Hamas out of business, but they've got to do both. And it's, you know, it's, it's dangerous. It's, it's complicated. And Hamas wanted to make it more dangerous and more complicated. Hey, I know how serious you take it, how serious your your team takes it, your staff. Uh, you were immediately on it, uh, making sure Israel was going to get what it needed. We, these programs, like the Iron Dome, are joint programs that assist both Israel and U.S. troops on the battlefield. And we are just grateful to have you battling for the United States and for Israel, our ally, uh, in the United States uh, Senate. Not just for Tennesseans, uh, which we are, but for all Americans, thank you for joining us, Senator Haggerty. It's such a busy time in our country. Absolutely. Thank you. You know, I mean, and Dad, I, I will tell you, I was with him that day. And first, of course, was just the shocking images we all saw. We were just couldn't believe what we were seeing, even though we've seen Islamic terror before, but at that level inside Israel. But the second thing I saw Senator Haggerty do, and uh, not to give anything away secret, was, was get right on the phone and start working these situations. These are the kind of senators we work yeah. with on a daily basis. And this is why it's so important to support the work of the ACLJ. We're right there with them. Okay, so we have launched um, our new Faith and Freedom Drive. Uh, and it just started yesterday. We had a great response, by the way. By the way, also, over 2,000 of you became uh, ACLJ champions. Actually, 2,100 in the month of October. That was phenomenal. Here's what we want you to do. We know we're at an unbelievable moment in history. Uh, we know what's going on in Israel. Our team's fully engaged in Europe, here in the United States, in Washington. We're going to be next week. Um, we've sent already demands to the EU, congressional leaders, and the UN Security Council. We're meeting with the families next week in our offices. And we'll be representing some of those before the United Nations. We continue to fight for your constitutional rights. Our lawyers are in court on the 14th Amendment, Section 3 case involving President Trump being on the ballot. They're in court right now. Go to aclj.org forward slash faith and freedom, and your gifts will be doubled. Do it today. This is the time of year when we give thanks for all the blessings in our lives, our family, our health. But what about our more profound blessings that we as Americans are privileged to enjoy? Our faith, our freedom, unique liberties that so many people around the world can only dream about. Freedom to worship, freedom to speak, They are fragile freedoms that must be vigorously defended. And we've witnessed the attacks on faith and freedom on a global scale. It's time to take a bold step. To join us in the fight. To join us in upholding the Constitution. And to defend the freedoms you hold most dear for your family, for our country, and for the world. Go to aclj.org to support our faith and freedom drive. This time of years, we're giving thanks, celebrating our liberties that we have in the United States. We also see those liberties are under attack freedom to speak, our freedom of religion. Victories that we have won over decades are being refought again in courts and in the halls of Congress, in international institutions. We're seeing, of course, the conflicts raging around the world, not just in Ukraine, but now in the Middle East and our ally, Israel, which is so important to so many of our ACLJ supporters. So our liberties here at home, you know they're under attack. Our friends, our allies around the world, are under attack as well. That's why this faith and freedom drive is so important for you to donate. Dollar for dollar. You donate, we match. Dollar for dollar. Each donation. This is an important time, the most important time, to support the work of the ACLJ.
Thank you. It was great to have Senator Haggerty. If you missed that, we'll have it uh, clipped and posted for you on places like Rumble and wherever you watch our videos, uh, Facebook as well, and Twitter and X later today. But I do want you to know, I just want to underscore that even when we're not talking about it on the air, uh, we are with those kind of individuals. And sometimes you're just with them having a meeting and something like Israel happens and you're right in the mix with a U.S. senator or two or three of them that we actually were. And, and you're part of it, and you get, then get to continue to be part of it. And, Dad, that takes us into the work that we're doing next week in Washington. We're able to do all of this yeah. and coordinate it because we have had so much great donor support over the past couple of months. I'll, I'll tell you this. We are um, doing something that's unprecedented in ACLJ history. Yeah. We've never been able to do this situation like this. This is a unique. Of course, this is a unique situation. We're going to have representatives from families of hostages in our offices, and we, our government affairs team, is arra- there'll be Israeli lawyers there as well, have arranged uh, meetings with the House Republicans and House Democrats, Senate Republicans, Senate Democrats. Uh, we're going to have them on our broadcast on next Wednesday, live from Washington, D.C. So we're going to be able to bring you this kind of information, but it also tells you what we're doing. We are in the process of putting together a complaint to the United Nations. Now you say, well, who cares about the United Nations? Well, we know what's how corrupt it is, but you've got to be there. It's the Ministry of Presence. And it's going to put the U.N. in a bit of a vice. And uh, C.C. Heil is working with our international team on that. We've gone to the European Parliament and got a successful resolution there. But right now, as we continue to fight for constitutional rights all over this country, we've got lawyers in Denver, Colorado, as we're sitting here, they're arguing at a jury trial, a uh, judge bench trial in Colorado to make sure Donald Trump, and then it doesn't matter what you think of Donald Trump, but if he's the nominee, that he appears on the ballot. It's a 14th Amendment Section 3 challenge. And we've got that going on right now. We were requested yesterday, was it Michigan, Jordan? Yes. And the Michigan GOP has asked us to intervene in a case there, so we're working on that. We already have it in West Virginia and Virginia. Serious constitutional challenges. All of that's happening because of your support of the ACLJ. So we want you to support our faith and freedom drive. Very important. They'll put it up on the screen for you. Um, We need you now more than ever. The country needs you now more than ever. The same is true for the world. And, of course, Israel needs you, but also for free and fair elections. You're needed. Go to ACLJ.org and have your gift doubled through the ACLJ's Faith and Freedom Drive today. Uh, and also, if you can make that gift, let's say you give you know $50, if you could press monthly, recurring, you become an ACLJ champion. And that really it almost like quadruples the impact of your gift. So it doesn't cost you more other than the monthly gift, but it does affect how we operate. So I would encourage you to do that at ACLJ.org. Matching challenge for the Faith and Freedom Drive, but you can also make that a monthly gift and become an ACLJ champion. Andy Akon was in the studio with us. He has been working on these cases involving the 14th Amendment. We are in court in Colorado. I'm not too optimistic on how that court does. I'm very optimistic how we do it at the Supreme Court. But this is a huge challenge. And if Colorado were to get its way, an individual elected bureaucrat could remove a candidate from office with no oversight by a court. That's exactly right, Jay. What we don't want is for the Secretary of State in Colorado to make the decision that unilaterally the Republican nominee, whoever that might be, and it might be Donald Trump again, uh, is not permitted to be on the ballot. And the judge out there said that she was, quote, not prepared today, that was when she made the statement, to reconcile the competing theories for how the First Amendment's free speech protections interplay with the 14th Amendment insurrectionist plan. But she said also that there's clearly a conflict. On the one hand, you have people in the 1800s who were disqualified for writing a letter to the editor. That's clearly speech. But now the law has developed. She said you have a body of law holding that standards for finding incitement to insurrection are very high, and the speech needs to be very specific. So you, she realizes that she's got a balancing yeah. act yeah, that she has to perform. Let me tell you, you know where this case is going. I, we win great. I mean, I think we win at the Supreme Court in the United States. Jane Raskin, who is a, a special counsel to the American Center for Law and Justice and has, Jordan, quite a pedigree. I'm going to play some of her argument in just a moment. You want to go over that? Yeah, I want to tell people, too, because we've been, we've been telling you about – this fundraising effort, how we always want to make sure at the ACLJ as we take on these matters, whether it's a 14th Amendment case like in Colorado, of course we've got a team of ACLJ attorneys. But if we need to ever bring in someone who is an expert 
We don't want to have to think twice about the cost. We want to just be able to make the call and, and get them there. They want to do the work. We know who they are, and they want to be part of the team. And now she is a, a special counsel to the ACLJ. You may remember Jane. Uh, we worked with very closely and very publicly uh, with the Mueller investigation. She worked for President Trump and our team, and she also uh, was part of the team uh, defending President Trump in the first impeachment trial. But she is a major uh, a white-collar cr- criminal attorney. She's been inside the Department of Justice uh, prosecuting mobsters in the 1980s. Uh, so she's been inside the DOJ as a prosecutor. She's been an assistant uh, U.S. attorney as well. And when we said, you know, we need to be, be, be bringing the best of the best, even at the trial stage, because we know this is going to go up on appeal, so we have to have a great record. Let's get Jane out to Colorado. And we were able to do it, not having to think about the cost, because if so many of you signed up to be recurring donors, champ ACLJ champions, and because so many of you take part in these matching challenges. So we add to our team uh, of experts who then work with our team that was already there to take them up at a level. All right, we're going to go to the Colorado court. This is uh, our special counsel, Jane Raskin, before the court. As the Supreme Court has recognized, under our political system, a basic function of a political party is to select the candidates to be offered to the voters. Indeed, a party's ability to select its candidates implicates the First Amendment right to association. And Colorado law is entirely consistent with this. As the Supreme Court has... We're going to play... Let's get some more of that, too, for the days ahead. We're going to keep doing it. There'll be more as it comes. This just gave you a little bit... Gave you a little bit of a taste. So, um, Andy, it's also a vitally important case. It's a very important case because it sets standards that are going to be looked at around the country. And we need to set up, as Jane Raskin is doing out there, I know Jane very well, a record upon which an appeal is going to be taken. Because, as you said, Jay, and correctly noted, it isn't going to end with the state court in Colorado. This case is going to the Supreme Court of the United States. And we have a lawyer of Jane's constitutional proportions who is setting a record and creating a record for appellate purposes. And when appellate courts look down, they look at the record that you create in the trial court, and you've got to have a good lawyer establishing that record. And uh, she'll do it. She's doing a great job. And then I, I think I'll be arguing that in the Supreme Court and probably within six months is my guess, maybe less. It could be three months because of the – if she rules against us, it could be an expedited review. It could be January. That's how fast this can move, folks. We could have that case and the West Virginia case and the Virginia case right there. That's why we need you as part of our faith and freedom drive that we're in right now. I want to encourage you to go to aclj.org forward slash faith and freedom. As I said, the country needs you. We need you. The world needs you. Israel needs you. The election law integrity needs you to partner with us. So we've got the ACLJ faith and freedom drive. Next week, we will have the major announcement as we expand our expand our efforts. I've given you a little bit of taste of it on what we're going to be doing in Israel, folks. Few organizations have the capacity to do this. We have an office in Jerusalem, so your support here is critical. Yes, and we've been going after Hamas just in the past couple of weeks in Europe through our European Center for Law and Justice that you've been supporting for decades for such a time as this, such an important time in the United States and Israel. Support our work. Donate. Be part of the Faith and Freedom Drive. Double the impact of your donation. Go to aclj.org today. We're standing for your rights all over the world. Informed and engaged. Now more than ever. This is Seculo. 
And now your host, Jordan Seculo. Right, folks, we have breaking news. I, and this one needs explanation, so I'm glad we have that expertise. Our office in Israel, again, you support our work through the this ACLJ Faith and Freedom Drive to continue to expand on all of this work and the expertise we have in this part of the world, whether it's the Middle East, Europe, uh, again, uh, here in the United States, where we've got people in court defending your rights so you can vote for the candidate of your choice in the upcoming primary. Uh, and we just showed you that. The U.S. just announced that it is trying to broker with Israel, who seems to be okay with it at this point, a brief, they're using the word brief cessation, so not a ceasefire, but a brief cessation of military operations in Gaza to allow for hostage, hostages to be be released safely and humanitarian aid yeah. to get distributed. This would not mean that conflict would be over. What we be- and remember, Prime Minister Netanyahu actually agreed to this before, and two hostages were released. They they halted some of the shelling, and they were released. They went right back to war. So it's not a ceasefire. There is some concern, though, Dad, because the last time they tried to broker one of these out of the UAE, Hamas demands were so high that it just didn't happen. And it may be that you're setting the stage for them doing that again and saying, look what they're doing, so outrageous, nobody could do it. But it's just interesting. The White House officials have said that the request for the pause was far different from an overall ceasefire, which the Biden administration believes would benefit Hamas by allowing it to recover from Israel's intense bombardment. So they are talking about here a very narrow window of negotiating time. Now, we have done these negotiations for hostages. We have done these kind of negotiations in the Middle East and Israel. Yeah. Dealing with hostile parties, including the Palestinian Authority, the timing of these, Andy, it's very quick. You've got to move. These are these are not weeks. These are hours. Hours, literally hours. Uh, these pauses are uh, designed or intended to be able to release humanitarian aid to be distributed through trucks to the shelters and to other people. But, but also for hostage release. And, but, and for hostage release. It gives the Hamas an opportunity to release the hostages. But again, as Jordan pointed out, we are not advocating a ceasefire. Nor is the White House. And the White House is not advocating that either. We were able to get a, a family being held hostage in the Gaza Strip whose husband was killed, a Christian who ran the Bible Society there, when a war broke out in Gaza. And what I was told by the Israelis government was, keep your phone on 24 hours, then we're going to tell you when to get on the plane. While you're on the plane, make sure your Wi-Fi is on. You're going to tell her and her children when to show up at what crossing and at what time. They better be there then, regardless of what they're seeing on TV, regardless if, if Hamas is there. Then Hamas is going to open the gate. Don't talk to them. Just walk through the gate. There's going to be a car waiting for them on the other side in Israel. It's going to take them across the state of Israel and deliver them to their family in Bethlehem. And let me tell you something. We got the call in the middle of the night. We jumped on an airplane. We were texting. The moment we landed, she was walking. She she called me. She literally had just walked across, gotten through that Gaza Strip point, through Ham- Hamas, opened the door. She went, got into the car. She, while she was on the way to the Pal- Palestinian Authority into Bethlehem, where her family lives and much more Christian Palestinians are, the war restarted already because, remember, we, we were I was going through customs while we, on the phone with her, and you could see on the TV – the shelling yeah, began. So, so these, talk, these these sensations are quick. This, yeah. So we we have uniquely, as Jordan just yes. said, we have done this. So we know how important this is, which is the reason why, folks, we need the resources to get these two hundred and probably seventy people out, as many as we can help. We were told today we thought we we're going to have five, six families. We told today we're up already, maybe twenty or thirty that need our assistance. We need your help on this. We've got an ACLJ Faith and Freedom Drive. That's freedom in the United States. It's freedom in Israel. It's freedom around the globe. But we have got direct action. And like Jordan said, we have done it. We have negotiated and have used those short-term cessation of hostilities. Not, 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 it's, not a, it's not a ceasefire to get people out. Your support is critical. We encourage you to do it today. ACLJ.org forward slash faith and freedom. Any amount you donate, we get a matching gift board. And folks, if you make it a monthly gift, you become an ACLJ champion. And almost 100 of you did that yesterday. Folks, you, you ACLJ champions are taking us to the next level, folks, who are becoming those recurring donations. But even if you can only make the donation once, the country needs you. You know that. The world needs you. And Lord knows, the people of Israel, the land of Israel, needs you as well. Go to ACLJ.org. Be part of our Life and Liberty Drive. Donate today. What does it mean to be an ACLJ champion? Becoming an ACLJ champion means joining us in the fight for liberty 
in the fight for law, in the fight for peace, in the fight for freedom. The battles being fought in courtrooms right now will decide what kind of future our kids will have tomorrow. So when you join as an ACLJ champion, we now actually have a baseline to know what we can possibly accomplish. And it, look, the dream is, is vast. Being a champion means that you get to come alongside churches who are being zoned out of properties, who are being forced to obtain liquor licenses simply to operate, coming alongside students who are being told they can't read their Bible in school or even bring it. Becoming an ACLJ champion allows us to take on more cases internationally in places where Christian persecution is happening on a daily basis. The need for the defense of these Christians is overwhelming, and we can't do it without you. Becoming an ACLJ champion means getting into a fight with deep state elites who are attacking our school children, who are attacking pro-life Christians. We have lawyers right now winning in courtrooms across the world, but none of it would matter without the ACLJ champions. Simply put, we don't win unless ACLJ champions continue to step up. We can't do what we do without you. By becoming a monthly donor, you can become a champion of life. A champion of liberty, a champion of freedom. Please join us. Please join us. Please join us. Become an ACLJ champion today. about and we are working on a lot of things we're not even talking about yet this week on the broadcast we'll be able to tell you about more maybe tomorrow and next week uh, but there's uh, some breaking news we just got to for a little bit here and it's great to go over this because we've got a, a senior counsel with the ACLJ uh, you know him well as a former CA director and former secretary of state Mike Pompeo I can't think of a better guest to have right at this moment right now when this news broke about uh, these hostages some of them uh, American. We know it. it yeah. It's under, dual citizens, right? We're being told under 10 right now by yeah. the White House. But there's also many Europeans. Well, there's as also well. a report, just so you know, I was talking to the Israelis last the night, that the number could be up to close to 300 by tomorrow oh, yeah, I mean, they're, when they're, they're getting more of this. Um, Mike, let me tell you, they just uh, announced, or, or Anthony Blinken just announced, that they're going to urge the Israeli government to agree to a series of brief cessations, uh, cessation of military operations in Gaza to allow for hostage release and humanitarian aid. They're saying this is not a ceasefire. Now, we have done, Jordan and I worked on a one of these brief cessations of fire and getting uh, uh, hostages out of Gaza. Pa the owner of the Palestinian Bible Society was uh, murdered in broad daylight, stabbed 43 times by Hamas. We got his family and his kids out, and the Israelis worked out this, like, I mean, when I say brief, I think it was 15 minutes. It was during Operation Castle. It was during Operation Castle, and we got him out. The hostage situation is is dramatic. We're now starting to represent a lot of these families. Uh, how you were the Secretary of State? What's the approach here that would be most successful? Well, there's there's nothing wrong with directing fires away from a place you're trying to get your own people out. There's no that's not problematic at all. It becomes damaging to the important work the Israelis are doing when you talk, start to talk about ceasefires and you know days long pauses allowing Hamas to rearm, refit, and resupply. Uh, but if if Secretary Blinken has negotiated a solution that allow the Israelis to continue their important work, to still create space that is secure so that you can bring these hostages out, that's exactly the mission set. The One of the reasons you put the pressure on Hamas, one of the reasons you challenge Iran, is so that you can get Americans out, that you can get Europeans out, you can get Israeli citizens and children, women and children, back to their families. So, look, I applaud this diplomatic effort so long as it is truly aimed at stopping the fire only so long as it benefits getting our hostages out, precisely what the ACLJ has done such amazing work on, uh, not only in this situation, but there's a long re track record of you all, Jay Jordan, doing this. And so uh, bless you for that. Thank you, uh, Secretary Pompeo. And, and again, thank you for all of your work. I I want to talk to you about this because it is it is an issue, right? Uh, this seems like the kind of move, and Prime Minister Netanyahu and the Israeli government has been okay with this. This has already happened once, and two hostages 
were released. There was another hostage that was freed by the IDF. Uh, but then they went back again and tried to negotiate one of these and were unsuccessful because the demands from Hamas were just too high. Is there a way for the, the Muslim world, the Arab world, to go to Hamas and say, listen, you want to fight it out with Israel? That's up to you. But you've got to let these hostages out because you're, you're, you're losing the, the, the PR war ultimately to the whole world, to a European world that used to be, uh, even looks like sometimes, even now when you see these protests, is on your side. But we all also know Secretary Pompeo, you could see protests in the street. That's not usually a sign of the majority of the people. Majority of people all over the world never hit the streets in protest. Do you think the part, the Muslim world can play a role to get Hamas to at least let these hostages out? And if they want to go back to war with Israel, they can go back to full-scale war with Israel. Jordan, I'm counting on it. I pray that that's happening. I've, I've heard reporting that that is happening. I think it's I think it's true. Uh, Arab nations uh, in Qatar, the Emiratis, oh, they they all understand. You can't hold nine year olds. You can't hold elderly women. This is indecent. Um, you can't use them as human shields, nor can you use them as hostages to do battle with a country in the way that Hamas has. And so I am hopeful that they can see uh, it's bad for Muslims. Uh, it's bad for the Arab world. Uh, they they are they are duty bound to work to help uh, find a pathway to get every one of these hostages back to their families. And then to your point about combatants, different deal altogether. We all know how this rolls. Um, I'm confident that the Israelis can do what they need to do to protect their own nation. Um, but we need the Arabs uh, and the Gulf states working alongside of us, both to take care of civilians where we can, uh, to make sure that they get food and water that they need, but that this money doesn't go to Hamas, um, but at the same time to make sure we get every innocent civilian out of Gaza, not just those that were detained, taken across the border, but all those that have been held hostage, not allowed to travel across the border opening at Rafa as well. Uh, another issue that is uh, gigantic for us, and that is uh, we are representing students, Jewish students and uh, pro-Zionist Christian students in college campuses, Rutgers University in particular, but others. Now, you've got a piece up at ACLJ dealing with this and the anti-Semitism. I never thought, Mr. Secretary, that I would live to see the kind of anti-Semitism I am seeing right this moment. And then to have the White House at the very pinnacle of this anti-Semitism, when they announced the arrest of the student that was harassing the Jewish students at Cornell that could not even go to their kosher dining facility, that have classes are being canceled, and they're doing them by Zoom, that the administration would come out with their task force on Islamophobia. I see a lot of pro-Palestinian marches going on. I don't see very many pro-Israel ones, and I don't certainly don't see uh, many pro-Israel uh, student groups going out there. But the day they announce the arrest of the student that was harassing the Jewish students, the White House announces we now have a task force on Islamophobia. It is insane. Yes. It is tone deaf. It is illogical. Uh, you, you pick the descriptor at this peak moment here in the United States where we have seen not only, um, you know, just uninformed, ignorant kids who are in college who have been brainwashed by their faculty, but those institutions that, that have an obligation to know better just fail in the most fundamental duty to protect every student on their campus, to watch Jewish students have to hide, uh, to be fearful. Uh, I've seen it on campuses all across the country. And to then have the White House go out and say, gosh, the biggest problem we face today is Islamophobia is among the most indecent things I have seen. And to see the vice president go out and make an announcement like this, she should be ashamed of herself. Um, it is not only indecent, but dangerous as well. Um, we, we know that the threat today isn't to young students on campus who are pro-Palestinian protesters. No one's, no one's truly organized threats against them. There are organized threats against those of us who believe in Israel, believe in Zionism, and especially to Jewish students on campus. Uh, those institutions have a duty to protect them and to watch our government fundamentally misunderstand the risk today on our campuses and all across America. I've not seen anything quite like that, even from an administration that I think has let us down in so many ways. Uh, we all saw Secretary Pompeo after 9-11 that the majority of Americans do not blame Islam as a whole or Muslims as a whole 
for those terror attacks. They blamed Islamic extremism and the extremists within Islam. And Muslims came together with Christians and Jews, and President Bush put them together. People sometimes forget that, and there are right moments for that. But there's articles being written right now by the left. Uh, my producer just put this in my chat. This is on Salon.com. So, again, it's a, a liberal place. But you would think liberals wouldn't love Hamas. And the, the, the tagline for the article, MAGA and Christian nationalism, bigger threat to America than Hamas could ever be. It's disgusting. And they're talking about Mike Johnson, Speaker Johnson. But, again, you're part of that, that MAGA world. They're saying we're a bigger threat than Hamas and their ideology could ever be to the United States. Jay, you nailed it. It's disgusting. It's inaccurate. Um, it, frankly, it harkens back to a different time, Jordan Jay, that we never thought we'd go back to. There is a deeply rooted anti-Semitism buried in what they mask as progressivism. Uh, we, we, we knew that it sat there in pockets, but I didn't think the scale of what we have seen and these past weeks would ever emerge into public light where you have people actually defending the barbaric activity that took place in Israel on October 7th of this year. Uh, no look, the, perhaps one of the few things that has come out about this is pulled the mask off of some of this leftist silliness. And I think many, many people who, who were aside them, uh, beside them, who worked alongside them in important places in America, will see that these weren't true friends and allies. These weren't people who believed in the nation of Israel. It weren't, weren't people who believed in this rightful Jewish homeland. Nope. Uh, sadly, you're seeing those in government fail to do the right thing, to call this out in the right way as well. Um, you know, I, I put Salon in a bucket along with other anti-Semitic outfits in America who just fundamentally misunderstand the peace-loving nature of the Jewish people who live in Israel and Zionists all across the world, right. even those who are Christian Zionists exactly. as well. Exactly. Mike, we appreciate it so much, and thanks for being part of our team, and thanks for your insight, and thanks for your help on this project. Um, I, I got to tell you something, folks. Uh, we have people like Mike Pompeo because of your support of the ACLJ, and we're in our faith and freedom drive. And I, mean, I don't know what else I could tell you other than it speaks for itself. Look what, look what we're able to accomplish with your support for the ACLJ. Your donations, of course, this month are doubled in our Faith and Freedom Drive. We'd also ask you if you're able to make that gift that you give this month a recurring gift so you become an ACLJ champion because that over time really increases our budget. We have Jane Raskin, Mike Pompeo, Rick Rennell, Tulsi Gabbard, and our lawyers and expertise. ACLJ.org forward slash Faith and Freedom. Thousands of miles from the escalating violence in the Middle East, the cloud of war is smothering many college campuses here in the U.S. Vigorous debate and protests have erupted on college campuses since the Israel-Hamas war began, with some leading to violence and intimidation. We have seen over uh, uh, nearly a 400 percent increase in anti-Semitic incidents reported to us since October 7th. And we were already in this country at all time highs based on uh, the reporting that we have received. It is inexcusable and Harvard University has totally failed in terms of condemning the significant rise of anti-Semitism. The Cooper Union here in New York City, you had Jewish students who basically had to huddle in a library while demonstrators were banging the doors around them. It, it evoked these very disturbing images that we've seen, we thought, far in the past. At Tulane University in Louisiana, uh, there was uh, an, Israel, an Israeli flag being burned. A student, a Jewish student steps in to stop it and he gets hit in the face. And a Jewish student on campus is describing cradling this bleeding student, thinking they didn't just do this because they're angry at Israel. They're doing the this happened because he's Jewish. That's right. why I led with my colleagues in the House who are also Harvard graduates, ranging from Ted Cruz to newly elected House member Kevin Kiley, strongly condemning President Claudine Gay, that's the president of Harvard's mm -hmm. handling of this. She put a task force in place. The students should be expelled who are not only uh, going after Jewish students, but also saying these heinous, horrific anti-Semitic comments. People are afraid because their classmates are often sharing ideas that legitimize violence, that support the notion that Jews ought to be targeted. Shame on Harvard and all of these institutions for not taking a strong stance on this. We will put on the floor a resolution condemning anti-Semitism on college campuses, another area where Republicans will lead.
Welcome back to Sec Hill. We are taking your calls to 1-800-684-3110. There's a lot to talk about, obviously, and this is situations that are moving very quickly. And it's, it's awesome that we have these experts, members of Congress who we're very close with, uh, to come on the air and they can pivot as necessary because they are living this uh, every moment right now. Uh, both our domestic issues we're facing here in the U.S. Uh, and, and this new threat of terrorism that we were told about yesterday by our FBI director. And then today... Uh, we're told, you know, but yeah, there's that huge threat of terrorism, especially against Jews in America by basically every hate group in America. But the council we're going to announce today is uh, the Islamophobia council, because this is a time when Americans are really thinking about, uh, you know, it's uh, it's Muslims who seem like they're under attack when instead pa- radical extremists, some of them not even Muslims, just liberal college kids are protesting for, you know, free Palestine, kill the Jews in the streets. I don't see a lot of anti-Palestinian protests where anybody is using violent language, no. and especially not any general anti-Muslim protest because that would be wrong. Most Muslims, like Mike Pompeo said, this is embarrassing. Hamas is embarrassing if you're the UAE. If you're Qatar and you've tried to kind of uh, keep them in, the, in a box, yeah. which they have, you know, and you just hosted the World Cup, this is embarrassing. Because people think, you know what, maybe I shouldn't host the World Cup, or maybe I'm not going to put my business uh, uh, in uh, in the UAE. Maybe I'm not going to make that trip overseas or, or build that school or that hospital. I mean, we've seen uh, all the, that U.S. business go back. But the UAE yesterday wanted to make very clear that even though they don't love all of this going on, they wish the Palestinian civilians didn't have to face this, they still believe that the Abraham Accords, even though the Biden administration doesn't talk about it, are good as between Israel and the UAE. Yeah, exactly. So the, the, you, you do have these statement. Arab countries that are not thrilled at all with what's going on here. They're not in lockstep. All right, we're going to go to the phones. We said we would. Mary Ellen's calling from Illinois on line one. Mary Ellen, you're on the air. Oh, hello, and thanks for everything. We do pray for you. Thank you. Uh, but this uh, Islamophobia, I just think it's a White House deflection yep. of the real issue, which is anti-Semitism. And I had seen that the... Um, House did not pass the uh, censure against Talib, and it's like my friend's uh, uh, congressperson, Harriet Hageman, told her that, well, she voted for free speech. So how do we balance anti-Semitism and free speech here? Yeah, and the reason it lost, it went down, it was not because of uh, Democrats primarily. We knew they weren't going to support that, even the ones that don't like what she says because of free speech. There was a line in there, and I'm not defending, and again, I'm not sure... I would have had to read the whole thing to decide how I would have voted. I probably would have voted to sit sure just because I can't stand it, honestly. But, and I think she does actually promote violent rhetoric. But there were some, about 10 or so Republicans who said the censure went too far because they, they it, it said that she had called for an insurrection. And what they had said was, listen, we're starting to throw that term around way too much yep. in the United States. And you could, you they would have supported a censure, but for the fact that if you're, if she's caused an insurrection, she wouldn't just be censured. She should technically be taken out of Congress. There's also and, the speech. You have the speech and debate clause element of it. It was complicated legally. So I think if that line was out, yeah, probably would have gone. It would have gone through. Maybe, maybe that will be done in the future. We'll see. But you know what the truth is? Her voters are going to keep putting her there. A hundred percent. Let's so, keep using her to expose that world. Yep. Linda's calling from South Carolina on line two. Hi, Linda. You're on the air. Yes. I just want to say that I am in full support of Netanyahu's refusal to do a ceasefire. And I'm really concerned about the United States' laxity in supporting Israel. I'm really uh, very concerned about that. I think we need to be Israel's greatest ally. I agree with you. I think uh, the Netanyahu government's barely hanging on right now, which is what happens in these kind of situations. And... There, one other complicated, they are operating under what they call a war council. So you've got a unity government for, in fact, um, we're, we're going to probably hear from next week, the former Israeli prime minister will be on our broadcast, uh, Naftali Bennett. Yeah, I was going to talk to you about this, Deb, because one issue that we're working on, we haven't started telling people yet about next week in Washington, is exactly that. It's, it's keeping the Biden administration, we're not going to like everything they say. We're not going to like Kamala Harris saying about the Islamophobia. We're not going to like some of the things they say about the Israelis and how right. they conduct themselves. But so far, they have said, do not, no ceasefires. Right. 
And we want to keep them there. And we're, what we're going to do is continue to put people forward to make sure that they understand why a ceasefire cannot go into place. That's a, this is a this is, they're going to be the U.S. is the last line of defense for Israel at the U.N. Security Council. That's correct. That's why you got to be there. By Every the other way. country's turned. That's almost. why you got to be there. So people say, "Oh, you shouldn't be there." Well, except you can veto. Okay, we are the last line of defense. So we've sent demand letters in, uh, demand position papers in. We are. It looks like. And we'll be able to announce this next week. We may well be representing upwards of 20, 30 families uh, to go before the United Nations to advocate under a committee of the United Nations that's dealt with these takings. They call them disappearance, which is hostage taking. Um, they're very complicated. But Jordan and I have have done these and cessation of hostilities. Individuals at the UN before they trust our work. Yeah, we have good relations with the UN people actually uh, because we've had success. So we're going to deploy that. Now, that we can't give you a lot of information about that today and tomorrow. We will be giving you a lot of information about that next week. I'll be broadcasting out of Washington next week. But, folks, this is why. I mean, you've seen it today. Senator Haggerty, Mike Pompeo. These are the people we're dealing with. Jane Raskin and her team of ACLJ lawyers. I remind people that we're, it's not just... Israel, but we've, we're covering so many issues at one time. Oh, yeah. I mean, we've got lawyers, like I said, and, and Jane Raskin and, and and Nathan Garrett are out in uh, right now in Colorado. we got five lawyers to the ACLJ defending the right for the party, the Republican Party, to put the candidate of their choice on the ballot. And we've got this in four other states that we're litigating right now. It's going to go to the Supreme Court. So we're handling the Israel stuff. We're handling those. We've got school matters we're handling for students. One at Rutgers University. That letter, I think, goes out today. That demand. So there's a lot going on. The European Center for Law and Justice is really taking it to those European countries and putting that pressure on them, as they were able to do, to get the Council of Europe to designate Hamas finally as a terrorist organization, which means no more money from the Council of Europe. Interestingly, the U.S. might be sending money to uh, Hamas, but not the Council of Europe under that uh, European organ. And we're kind of taking each European organ step by step. That's, again, you, you sometimes ask, why is that office in Strasbourg? Why are you in France? What is so important there? And you think about, again, that French team, and it's an international team. They're not all French, but they're able to interact in a way that Americans can't at institutions, just the way the, the dialogue, the relationships, they live in a different part of the world. They also experience it differently because of the waves of Islamic immigration they've seen in their own countries. And remember, they experienced unbelievable amounts of terrorist attacks right. under ISIS. So when they see Hamas become more like an ISIS, like we've all said, we know, Dad, this is a time that we have to double down our work at the ACLJ and make sure this does not spread to the United States of America, where we have, uh, and again, this open border. And we talked about the people yesterday who were running it from the Middle East, or Palestinian uh, spokespeople, this is the time to fight back, and you can do it with us, folks. We are continuing our fight for constitutional freedoms in our country here in the United States. We're fighting around the world. We're in court today fighting for America's voting rights. We are working with our global affiliates to defend Israel at international tribunals. All of that is happening at the same time. In order to meet these unprecedented demands of really historical proportions, we've never seen anything like it, we've launched our faith and freedom drives. Your gifts will be doubled dollar for dollar. We need you. The country needs you. Israel needs you. And we need you here at the ACLJ. Go to aclj.org forward slash faith and freedom. Make a donation. We'll get a match. And if you can make that donation monthly, you become an ACLJ champion.